Hi everybody, welcome to the first week of Bio 156. Today what we're going to be doing is looking at how to use a scientific method to answer questions about the living world. Uh, before we go ahead and get started, I just want to make sure you guys know that you do have the lecture available to you to download, so you're more than welcome to do so. That is going to be found on the uh, week one scientific method section. If you go ahead and do download that, or if you open it up, you'll also notice that on the bottom left-hand corner over here, that there is gonna be a hyperlink to our online textbook that is gonna be OpenStats, Concept of Biology, Chapter One. So you're more than welcome to check that out, read along with it, um, that help you kind of strengthen your knowledge on the scientific method. Again, you're more than welcome to, or if you feel like the lecture suffices enough, or if you want to go ahead and check out some of the supplementary material I have for you, you're more than welcome to. I do suggest checking at least one or two of those out. I have them broken up. Um, there's a great series on the step-by-step -step scientific method that is fantastic. Uh, there are other ones like Brain Pops that kind of take you through that situational um, situations on using the scientific method. And I have some that kind of explained it a little bit in greater detail with some better visuals as well. Again, completely supplemental up to you if you feel like that's something you need in addition to this lecture. So with that being said, let's go ahead and get started with our learning outcomes. So what are we trying to do? Well, by the end of this week, you should be able to understand the process of scientific inquiry and differentiate into, uh, the different steps of the scientific method. That's just a big fancy way of kind of saying you'll understand how the scientific method works and you'll know each one of the steps and why they're so important. Number two, you'll be able to apply the scientific methods in given scenarios, including identification of variables and controls. Um, what that kind of means is if you're given a situation, you will be able to apply the scientific method in those situations, and you should be able to pick apart which portions of those scenarios fit in what sections of the scientific method. Um, one thing that I have found that students struggle with are variables and controls. Again, we're gonna talk about those, but I also have some supplementary material as well that go a little bit deeper into what variables are and what controls are and why they're so important to the scientific method. All right, so let's go ahead and check out what the scientific method is and all of the different pieces. Now, before we go ahead and look at some of our content, we're gonna go ahead and look at this over here, which is gonna be our flow chart. That's gonna show us each one of those steps. We're starting with step one over here, which is making an observation, two, coming up with a question, three, uh, forming a hypothesis that is gonna answer this question. Four, we're gonna make a prediction based upon the hypothesis. So what do we believe to be true or false? And then for number five, do an experiment to test this prediction. So we're actively trying to see if what we think is correct or not. Six, we're gonna analyze those results, see what they say. And then we're gonna to come to this part, essentially step seven, where we have two parts, either the hypothesis supported, so that means we were right, which means we'll just go down to this part and report our results. But let's say that we were wrong and it doesn't support it. Then what we would do is we'd go back, try again, and we would restate our hypothesis. And then we do this again until we have our hypothesis supported. So again, the scientific method is just a process of developing ideas. Again, it's a step-by-step -step process you're presented with something that you want to know more about or you find interesting, you're going to ask a question about it, come up with a hypothesis, things like that. Uh, it consists of a series of well-defined steps. So one thing that's important is if you look at other examples or if you look at other textbooks, um, this scientific method step system might be slightly different, but all the concepts are exactly the same. So some might have more steps, some might have less steps, but again, all the concepts are going to be the same. So let's go ahead and take a look at our observation and questioning. So we're going to look at about this portion first. So when it comes to observations, basically all that means is we want to see or we're noticing something. Okay, something is standing out to us. So again, when we make our observations, typically they have to do with our five senses. So it's either going to be smell, taste, um, sight, you know, things like that. So an example of an observation would be a scientist saw that mice given drug A have lower cholesterol than mice not fed drug A. So right there, we're noticing that we have some mice 
they're given some drug. And after they're taking this drug, they have a lower cholesterol than mice that do not. So great observation. Again, we're noticing that the mice that were given this drug have a lower cholesterol. Another example of an observation would be this over here. So independently, other scientists saw that drug A, again, that same drug right here that was given to our mice, is also lowering cholesterol in cats right here. So again, right there, we have two great observations. We're noticing two separate things. So based on these observations, we can go ahead and use our inductive reasoning skills and we can kind of make a statement or say something about drug A. So in this case, we can see that drug A is lowering the cholesterol of mice. Drug A is lowering the cholesterol in cats. So we might safely say that drug A can lower cholesterol. And because we know that now, because we made some inferences, we can go ahead and come up with our question right here. So what's a question that we can generate? Now, questions can be vast and varying. In this case, we might say something along the lines of, well, if drug A is lowering cholesterol in cats right here, and it's lowering it in mice, well, can it lower cholesterol in humans? So just like that, we went ahead and made a question. So we made some observations. We saw that this drug was doing something to mice and cats. We noticed that something was lowering the cholesterol. So we went ahead and um, used our inductive reasoning skills to say that drug A was lowering the cholesterol. And then we went ahead and came up with a question based upon that, does drug A lower cholesterol in humans? So we went ahead and did our first one, we did our second one. So now we're gonna go ahead and take a look at our hypotheses right here in our second section. So observations and questions generated are used to develop our hypothesis. And again, our hypothesis is essentially an answer to our question, or at least an educated guess. What do we believe? What do we think is gonna happen based upon the observation we made and based upon the questions that we've developed? So again, one important thing is it's gotta be a testable question. So something that we can actively do to whether or not see that it is true or if it's false. So an example might be our hypothesis drug A can lower cholesterol in humans. So just like our last slide, we saw that drug A was lowering the cholesterol in mice and in cats. We made the assumption that drug A can lower cholesterol. So now we're wondering, can it do it in humans? Okay, so now we have that for our hypothesis. So I'm sure you're wondering, well, what happens if I don't make a correct hypothesis? Or what happens if I overlook something and get something wrong? And that's completely fine. The scientific method remembers an entire step process on how to get or how to see if your hypothesis is true or not. And if it's not, that's completely fine. If it's not supported, if the data is saying that this is not true, that's completely fine. We just might have to go ahead and again, try again. We might have to go ahead and redefine and redo our hypothesis. And then we can go ahead and do, go through the methods again. Again, we won't have to go through this top part because we already came up with the observations and questions. We would just have to redefine and redo our hypothesis, which again, hypothesis is just going to be the answer to the question that we just asked. Okay, so our next part is gonna be our predictions right here. So when it comes to our predictions, you have to have a testable prediction based upon your hypothesis. So an example with this would be our hypothesis and predictions. If drug A, remember that drug that we made the observations in and we're asking questions about, we saw it lowered it in mice and in cats. We're wondering if it can do it for humans. So we went ahead and made our hypothesis. So now if drug A can lower cholesterol in humans, then five milligrams a day of drug A will lower the cholesterol in people with high cholesterol within one month. Now, one really important thing about this hypothesis statement is we have an if and then statement. Basically what an if and then statement does is if, so if this were to happen, then this is the result or the outcome that we're predicting. Again, if, is we're restating our hypothesis. So if drug A can lower cholesterol in humans, right? Because this was our hypothesis from here. 
Then, what do you think is going to happen? Then, if we're giving five milligrams a day of drug A, it will lower cholesterol in people with high cholesterol within one month. Again, if and then. If this were to happen, then this would be the result. Now, one of the things that we do need to do is when we do do our experiment, we do need to collect our evidence and we need to use the evidence to either identify to see if a hypothesis is being supported by the evidence or being rejected, okay? So now we're gonna move on to the experimental portion of this. So we went ahead and made our observation. We asked a question, we formed a hypothesis that answers that question. We went ahead and made a prediction based upon the hypothesis. Remember using our if and then statement. So now we need to go ahead and figure out a way we can actually test this. Okay, we went ahead and laid out tons of the groundwork and we're basically proposing an answer to our question. So now we need to see if that answer, the answer that we're proposing is gonna be correct or not. And we need to back it up with uh, evidence. So we need to back it up with either um, qualitative or quantitative data. Qualitative is things that we can see. Quantitative are going to be numbers. So let's go ahead and take a look at an experimental setup Experiment drug A is administered to individuals who have who have low cholesterol levels. Now, does this experiment or does this experimental test have um, test our hypothesis? What we're trying to look at. In this case, no. Because remember, when we're making an experiment, it needs to actually test our hypothesis and our prediction. So if we think back. To here, remember, we're saying that if this drug can lower cholesterol, then if we're adding five milligrams per day or giving somebody five milligrams per day, drug A, with lower cholesterol in people, or it will lower cholesterol in people with high cholesterol. In this case, they're giving it to low cholesterol. So this, although an experiment, wouldn't yield us the data sufficient enough to answer our question. So in this case, we would need to change this and put it back to people who have high cholesterol. So now we're gonna go ahead and take a look at our results. So we went ahead and collected all of our data. Remember, we made an observation about drug A, and it's supposed to lower cholesterol. We have a question, if it can lower it in mice and cats. Can it uh, lower it in people? So our question or our hypothesis is, can it lower cholesterol in people? And then our prediction is if it lowers cholesterol, then if we give five milligrams a day to somebody with high cholesterol, it should lower it. We went ahead and set up our experiment. We're gonna do five milligrams per day to people with high. Oops. cholesterol and now we're going to analyze those results looking at this graph over here we can see the effect of drug a on cholesterol levels of individuals over 40 okay and you can see that we have two groups we have one group which is going to be our experimental group and then one group which is going to be our control all a control is is something of comparison so in order to see that drug A is actually doing something, we need to compare it to people who never took drug A, because sometimes there might be not be a correlation, there might be something else, who knows? So we have a control again, and we're gonna compare it to our experimental. So in this case, we can see that we do have a large percent de decrease to the people who took drug A versus people who didn't take anything, okay? So we have some evidence that is going to support our hypothesis. 
So now what we're going to do is we're going to take those results and we're going to go ahead and move on to our step seven, which we need to decide whether or not our data is supporting our hypothesis, basically meaning that our educated guess was correct, or is it going to reject it, meaning that it was incorrect, and then we have to go back to the drawing board and redefine our hypothesis. Okay, so based upon our last slide, we saw that the people who were taking drug A did see a lower or a decrease in their cholesterol levels. So in this case, we would have a supported hypothesis. Again, if the hypothesis were to be rejected, so that means we saw that data and it was not decreasing, then we would have to go back and redo our hypothesis. And then we would just do these portions again. Okay. And again, it's very, very normal to have your hypothesis rejected. Again, remember, we went from making an observation, we asked a question, we used our inferences or our background knowledge to kind of form up a question. We made a prediction as to what we think it was going to be. Remember, if and then our then statement. So we're still making an educated guess, a very strong educated guess based upon our background knowledge. So if we do make an incorrect hypothesis, completely fine. That's why we have this portion here where we can go ahead and redefine and redo our hypothesis in order to redo our steps. OK, so let's now go ahead and see our summary of our question. Is drug A safe and affected at lowering cholesterol in humans? So our hypothesis, remember, if drug A is a safe and effective treatment for high cholesterol in humans, then five milligrams a day of drug A will lower cholesterol with, uh, within people with high cholesterol in a month. So remember, if, which is our restatement of our hypothesis, or then, what do we think the outcome is going to be? So and we took that, and then we went ahead and created our experiment. So we were administering drug A to individuals with high levels of cholesterol. Remember, we stated that there in our prediction with five milligrams a day for one month. Our prediction came to be true based upon our data because we saw that there was a percent decrease, a substantial percent decrease in our cholesterol levels in comparison to our control group, which GM were people who did not take anything. And because it was true, then that means our hypothesis was supported, meaning that our hypothesis and prediction were correct. And then again, we would like to repeat it because the larger our sample size are, and then the more data we have to support it would improve the efficacy or how strong our prediction and hypothesis are. Now, if our prediction was false, and our data did not support this, so in this case, there was no decrease, then this would mean our hypothesis was rejected, which would just mean that we need to modify our hypothesis and still repeat it. Because again, the more data we have to support our claims, the better our test would be. Okay, so, what I want you to do now is I want you to go ahead and take an opportunity to look at these two pictures. Now, using your knowledge of the scientific method, this image, and your imagination, write out the steps of the scientific method as they relate to one or both of these diagrams, okay? So see if you can use the scientific method in order to kind of explain or see what's going on within these pictures, okay? All right, so if you needed a little bit more time, you could pause the video um, or you can go ahead and follow along with me. So in this case, you can see that we have two different images. And I'm just gonna go ahead and explain how I would go about this. So you can see we have two different parts. Now we need to make some observations. Some easy observations we can see are we have students in both of them, but one of them 
we can see that we have a band in the background. So just like that, we went ahead and made our observations. And then we can come up with some questions. So how are the student performance doing between a noisy room and a non-noisy room? And then now we can go ahead and make our hypothesis. So we can say something along the lines of, um, this might be an integrated classroom and this might be an isolated classroom. So we could say that the integrated high, uh, integrated classroom does better than the individualized. So that could be our hypothesis. So then we would go ahead and make our if and then statement. So we can say, if we have an integrated classroom, then performance would increase because there's a larger variety within the room. And then we can go ahead and do our experiment and we can see or test the performance of this room versus this room. And then based upon our results, it would either support our hypothesis or reject it. Again, remember support just means that our initial hypothesis was correct. And then we can move on to our last part, which is going to be looking at, at our, our uh, reporting our findings. Or if it was rejected, we would just have to go back and redo our hypothesis, redo our if and then statement, redo our experiment, and then finally redo or relook at our results. So this is a little bit of an example of kind of what that would look like. Again, if you came up with something else, that's completely fine. Remember, the scientific method is just a way of organizing your ideas and coming to conclusions. So if you went ahead and said something different, then that is absolutely and completely fine. So that is going to conclude our lecture for today. Um, remember, you do have a quiz, you do have your assignment, so please make sure you're staying on top of those. Um, and the last thing I do want to mention is, or last thing I want to remind you is there are two different lectures you can look at. There's my lecture, there's also Dr. Cart's lecture. So again, if you feel like I didn't do the greatest job of connecting certain concepts, you, again, you're more than welcome to view hers as well. And I also put tons and tons of supplementary material out for you. Um, again, I highly would suggest checking out the Amoeba Sisters. It's a great uh, way that they condense the scientific method down into about eight minutes. And I also have videos um, showing you the step-by-step -step process of the scientific method as well. It's broken up into about four videos and it goes over the vocab as well. So uh, again, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, please feel free to reach out. I'd be more than happy to um, help or clarify anything. Okay. Good luck this week and have an awesome rest of your day. I'll see you next week.